Less dead is a term coined to describe a large majority of the victims of serial killers, those who society has deemed less valuable than others. Vulnerable people who live on the fringes of society, whose disappearances and deaths go unnoticed, unreported, and uninvestigated. I'm Taylor. I'm Kat, and welcome to Square Mile of Murder. This week, and next week because it's a big one, we're looking at the unsolved case of the Long Island serial killer also known as the Lisk, and the Gilgo Beach Killer. This unidentified suspected serial killer is believed to be responsible for the murders of at least 10 victims between 1996 and 2010, although some believe there will likely be more victims as yet undiscovered. Some of the victims have not yet been identified, but almost all of those who have been were sex workers who advertised their services on the website Craigslist. We're also going to talk a bit about the concept of the less dead and how it affects cases such as this one. Yep. So before we get like super deep in, just a quick note on language and terminology. So some sources describe the victims in this case as escorts, some say prostitutes, others say sex work or sex workers as an umbrella term. And some, of course, as you may or may not expect, but probably do, aim to be as derogatory as possible. Um, Some people claim that sex work is the correct term as it's more respectful. Some sex workers agree with this, and others disagree about what they want to be called. Um, And there's actually an interesting discussion about this in the first episode of the BBC Sounds podcast, Who Killed Emma?, which we highly recommend, which we've talked about before yeah Um, i think it was a patreon episode though when we talked about it yeah so um yeah very very good podcast very good yeah highly highly recommend recommend. there's also a i want to say bbc disclosure episode that like is the shortened and video version of that story basically so it uses some of the same audio yeah don't think it's available on iPlayer though. Because right. you told me about it and I couldn't find it. Oh, it was like maybe six months ago, but oh. um I could it it could easily be gone now, <laughs> considering how quickly iPlayer seems to get things in and out. Yeah. Um but anyway, yeah. Highly recommend that. Um So we're going to use the term sex worker for the sake of ease, but also because these victims can't tell us what they would prefer to be called. And this seems like the least worst option. Yeah. And it is an umbrella term for a lot of different types of sex work. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are many points within the last 25 years at which we could begin talking about this case. But, like most other podcasts and shows about the Long Island serial killer, we're going to start with the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert in May 2010. So Shannon was the eldest of four daughters and grew up in New York State. Her mother, Mary, described her as being book smart, having graduated high school at the age of 16, but not street smart. After a few years of working in the local area, Shannon moved to Jersey City with her boyfriend and she reportedly had dreams of becoming a singer on Broadway. Mm. But, sadly, like so many who moved to the big city with dreams of stardom, Shannon never got her big break. She was taking online classes and supporting herself through sex work. Shannon reportedly signed up with an escort agency in Jersey City, but later decided to go it alone, advertising her services on Craigslist. Craigslist was a popular way for sex workers to advertise their services, as was the now defunct Backpage.com. Shannon, like many other sex workers, advertised on these sites because they could make more money and keep a larger share of the money that they did make than working through an agency or in something like a brothel. Uh, Shannon kept two-thirds of her fee and paid the other third to her driver, according to an article by New York Magazine. For some sex workers, their driver was also there for security, but there were plenty who worked without a driver or any kind of bodyguard. 
Craigslist's erotic services section was incredibly controversial, as was Backpage.com. Although both websites claimed that using their sites was the safest way for sex workers to advertise compared to Compared to printed classified ads in newspapers or street-based sex work, there were many problems with each site. Uh, Craigslist shuttered its erotic services section around 2010, causing many of its users to move over to Backpage.com, and in 2018, Backpage.com was seized federal agencies as part of a wide-ranging criminal investigation. So whilst the two sites claimed that they were a much safer option for sex workers, both had a problem with underage users and sexual slavery and sexual trafficking of adults and minors. Despite Craigslist claiming to have tools in place to safeguard users and you know flag ads from underage or potentially trafficked individuals. Now, we could do a two-parter on these two websites alone. The laws that were broken, the ones that weren't, which is a shorter version probably how the law failed to protect underage and trafficked victims, the people that argue for the censorship of these sites, and the ones who argue that rape and sexual slavery are the prices we must pay to keep the internet free and unrestricted. Because yes, that is the argument. Not a good one. No. In lieu of us doing that, uh, I definitely recommend the documentary I Am Jane Doe. I saw it on Netflix, UK Netflix, but it's not on Netflix anymore. Mm. But it is available to like buy or rent on YouTube and uh, Vimeo. It is heartbreaking, mm-hmm. gut wrenching, eye opening in the worst ways, as it follows the stories of some of the Jane Doe's involved in the various lawsuits against Backpage as well as the response from politicians and special interest groups as the debate carries on over how to make sex work safer and keep the internet uncensored and stop sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. So, in the early hours of May 2010, Shannon and her driver Michael Pack arrived at a client's house in the private-slash-gated community of Oak Beach. Pack waited in the car while Shannon was inside the house with the client, as was pretty standard on these jobs. But that all changed at about 5 a.m. when the client came out to the car asking asking Pack for his help. Inside the house, Pack found Shannon cowering and clutching her cell phone in fear. She had called 911 at 4.51 a.m. During her 23-minute call to 911, Shannon was panicked, uh, convinced that someone was, quote, after her and, quote, they were trying to kill her. And Pack, throughout this time, was trying to coax her out of the house and into the car. Uh, Many believe this to have been the result of a bad trip, as Shannon had a history of addiction problems and was known to procure drugs with slash for her clients. However, Shannon also had bipolar disorder and a history of not taking her medication. So her reaction and panic state could have been a result of drugs, mental health problems, or her client and possibly an accomplice actually trying to kill her. Uh, After failing to convince Shannon to leave the house with him, Pack went outside to wait for her to come out on her own accord, but a few minutes later she bolted from the house and ran off through the gated community. Pack followed her in the car, but she kept running and screaming for help. She knocked on doors, begging for help, um, and a female resident who was home alone called the police but was afraid to let her inside her house and told Shannon to shelter on her porch, but Shannon was too scared and continued running. So I've seen a lot of hate for this woman and how, you know, if she had let Shannon inside, she might still be alive. And it's very easy for us to judge. If you live in this, like, upscale private community, you would probably be scared to let someone in your home who's been running around the streets screaming, you know, with a black SUV following them. Yeah. Especially if you're home alone. Like, I would be scared if that happened on my street and I was home alone. But, like, I'd be terrified. Another resident, a man named Gus Coletti, was up early that morning, and when Shannon knocked on his door terrified and begging for help, he opened the door and she ran straight inside. Coletti offered to call the police, but Shannon for some reason begged him not to, and then she fled his house, leading in the general direction of the nearby Gilgo Beach. 
The Suffolk County police arrived around 45 minutes after Coletti last saw Shannon, and Pack spent over an hour driving around Oak Beach looking for her, but there was no sign of her. A police search also found no trace of Shannon. Uh, Coletti, Pack, and the client were all questioned. The client, Joseph Brewer, was cleared because there was no evidence of any wrongdoing, and the same with Coletti and Pack. According to New York Magazine, Brewer said he hadn't seen Shannon take any drugs or even have any on her, and that all he wanted was company that night, not drugs, not even sex. So Shannon's case went cold. But in December, seven months after Shannon vanished, everything changed. On December 11th, 2010, a canine officer and his cadaver dog discovered human remains on the roadside of Ocean Parkway along Gilgo Beach. Now, there's a lot of conflicting stories about how the discovery was actually made. Some say it was part of like a routine search in the area for Shannon Gilbert. Others say it was just by chance that the officer was in the area with the dog and another story, which made it into the Netflix film Lost Girls, about this case based on the book, also called Lost mm. Girls, is that the officer pulled over and let the dog out to pee. And that's when the dog picked up the scent of human remains. The official story is that the officer had searched many sections of the local area with the dog throughout the summer and autumn, and that on this December day, they were starting searching the land just off the parkway based on FBI data, which indicates that bodies are often dumped close to roads just out of sight. The officer and dog tracked the scent to the skeletal remains of a woman wrapped in torn and disintegrating burlap sack. Initially, people believed that it was Shannon who had been found. Now, Shannon's case, thanks to her mother, had garnered a great deal more local media attention than most missing sex workers. But a few years earlier, Shannon had a titanium plate grafted onto her jaw following a fight with her boyfriend at the time. How much of it was a fight and how much of it was a beating mm. is uh, questionable. This body did not have a plate grafted onto the jaw. And within days, three more sets of skeletal remains wrapped in burlap had been found just within a few hundred metres of each other. The four bodies were identified as 25-year-old Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, age 24, Megan Waterman, 22, and 27-year-old Amber Costello. All four of the... Missing women were sex workers and had been strangled. All of them had been reported missing by their loved ones, but unfortunately, nobody really cared. Uh, Jacqueline Gallucci talked about this in an article for the Long Island Express titled Lost Girls, When Women Go Missing on Long Island, Some Matter, Prostitutes Don't. And we've linked this in the show notes. Um, it was written almost two months before the first body was found. The article focuses on Megan Waterman, the third body to be found on Gilgo Beach, who was reported missing in May 2010. Megan was from Maine, but before she went missing, she had been staying at a motel in Suffolk County, Long Island, about 15 miles from Gilgo Beach, um, and she had been supporting herself and her daughter through sex work, placing ads on Craigslist. The article examines the treatment of Megan as a missing person and another sex worker named Jennifer, who was murdered just three months before Megan disappeared, and compares it to the treatment coverage of a local teacher who had been murdered two years earlier. The teacher, Leah, was strangled by her husband, who then dumped her body in a wooded area near the Long Island Expressway in 2008. Jennifer was strangled by a client who had contacted her after she placed an ad on Craigslist, because... She wouldn't refund him the $80 he paid her. Um, that's why he murdered her. Uh, and she was buried in a shallow grave. The man who killed Jennifer confessed to police and led them to the shallow grave, and then pled guilty at trial. He was found guilty in 2011. Uh, we couldn't find his sentence, but after his conviction, an article said he was likely to face 25 to life at his sentencing. Leah's husband eventually admitted to her murder in court and was sentenced to 18 to life. 
Megan's family believe that she may have been forced into sex work by her boyfriend, who was acting as her pimp and was usually her security on calls. But the night she disappeared, he left her alone. Now, although the murder- murderers in both Jennifer and Leah's cases were convicted, their attitude from those in the local area towards each of the women was very different. Leah's death was a tragedy. Jennifer's was inevitable. Good riddance to bad rubbish, if you will. And this is exactly what we mean when we talk about the less dead. Young school teachers in middle class areas are a tragic loss, which of course they are. Obviously, anyone yeah. murdered is a tragic loss to their community and those who love them. And it dominates the media for weeks. Look at uh, the Gabby Petito mm-hmm. case. Last, was that last year or this year? 2021 like summer to fall yeah like it dominates the media cycle for weeks but vulnerable sex workers have it come in and their murders are no loss to society that's that's the crux of it isn't it yeah and this kind of attitude allows serial killers to commit crimes for literally decades without ever being detected or captured arrested whatever because sadly missing and murdered sex workers and other vulnerable members of society are not a high priority for either law enforcement or the general public and the lack of interest or urgency by the general public or law enforcement means that we don't know much about most people who fall into this category of the less dead they are referred to mainly by their job for example sex worker drug dealer or their health issues, addict, bipolar, any mental health problems. Mm-hmm. And this leads to a lot less public pressure to solve the case, which sends it to the cold case pile, and allows serial killers to continue murdering. It also means that the victims are reduced to little more than stereotypes and statistics. And one aspect of that makes this case a little bit different from many other serial killers where the victims have all been vulnerable people who fall into this category of the less dead is that, as I just said, most of these cases, the victims are a name and a negative adjective or just John and Jane Doe. But in the case of the Long Island serial killer, we actually know quite a bit about many of the victims. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Um, so the three women found alongside Megan Waterman were Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, and Amber Costello. Maureen was originally from Connecticut. She'd been a straight-A student in high school with a love of poetry and songwriting, according to New York Magazine. Her life changed when she became pregnant at the age of 17 and dropped out of school. She got married and got her GED, uh, which is <laughs> um, general general generally... education diploma, diploma, I think, or or general equivalency diploma or something. It's basically if you didn't graduate from high school when you were a teenager or like of the age when you should have graduated from high school, you can go back to like community center run classes, usually night classes and study the things you would have learned in high school to pass. So you basically get your high school diploma, but it's not called that. It's called a GED. Um, so you hear a lot about, yeah, people in, adverse situations in their teens then later going back to get their GED or Mm -hmm. in some cases uh, people who are in prison have a tendency to get their GED in prison Um, yeah first time I'd ever heard of GED was on Orange is a New Black yeah when some of them are studying for it yeah yeah I'm not sure what the um, general education development tests, which are a oh. group of four subject tests, which when passed provide certification that the test taker has United States or Canadian high school level academic schools. It's an alternative to the U.S. high school diploma. So 
not either of the uh <laughs> Not not what we thought no, it stood not for. not either of the acronyms that I thought it stood for. So anyway. Um, so yeah. Maureen got married and got her GED after her daughter was born. She and her husband divorced and shared custody of their daughter while Maureen worked two jobs to get by. In 2006, Maureen saw an ad online claiming, you can be a model, after sending some photos in and going through the process of becoming a model. A friend she made during this process introduced her to sex work on Craigslist. Maureen began traveling to New York City on weekends, telling people she was going to modeling jobs, but in reality she was working, and she would continue doing sex work on and off to support herself and her daughter. She got pregnant again sometime in 2006 and gave up sex work until after her daughter was born. Maureen disappeared in July 2007, almost three and a half years before she was found. After telling friends and family that she was going to New York City for a day out, although most of them either knew or at least suspected that she was a sex worker in New York City, uh, none of them ever knew about her working out on Long Island. Uh, She called a friend from the Port Authority over the weekend saying all of the money she'd earned had been stolen and that she needed a ride home. But the friend was unable to come and get her that night, and she was never seen or heard from again. Uh, But that's not the end of Maureen's case. Shortly shortly after she vanished, a friend of Maureen's named Sarah received a phone call from a man who claimed that Maureen was alive and well and living in, quote, a whorehouse in Queens. The man didn't give Sarah any details of this supposed whorehouse, and she never heard from him again. And she also said that the man had no discernible accent. Two years later, in July 2009, 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew, originally from Buffalo, but at that time living in the Bronx, disappeared after meeting a client from Craigslist. After finishing high school, Melissa got her cosmetology license and worked as a hairdresser when she moved to New York City in 2007. Her aim had been to eventually save enough money to open her own salon in the city but at some point she turned to sex work to pay the bills. She told her mother that she was just dancing in a club, but her mother told New York Magazine that the family were worried about her as Buffalo is a long way from New York City, and if anything happened, it would take them eight hours to get there. It also isn't uncommon for sex workers to play down the kind of work they're doing, for example, saying they are dancers or strippers in saying, instead of saying that they're actually selling sex. And Megan Waterman did the same thing, telling her family she was only pole dancing. Um, so Melissa's mother also said that she'd been depressed and that when she last visited Buffalo, the family had tried to convince her to stay as they had a restaurant there and that there was a job for Melissa if she wanted it. Uh, But Melissa was determined to stick it out and return to New York. And it wasn't until later that her family found out the truth about what she was actually doing. Um, Although her sister Amanda knew the truth about the kind of sex work Melissa was doing. Um, Following Melissa's disappearance, Amanda picked up a number of phone calls made to their mother's home in Buffalo. The caller used racial slurs towards Amanda, who is mixed race and asked if she was going to turn into a, quote, whore, like her sister. The number came up as Melissa's mobile phone, and police managed to locate one of the calls in Manhattan and another in Massapequa, which is out on Long Island. And the caller knew what Amanda looked like, and the family feared that he knew where they lived, and they moved shortly after receiving these calls. The final Gilgo 4 victim was 27-year-old Amber Costello, a Long Island transplant who grew up in Wilmington, North Carolina. Amber's story is slightly different to the other victims. While all the women were known to use drugs recreationally, yeah, so pretty common um, to be providing drugs and taking them with clients, uh, but Amber's family knew that she had issues with heroin addiction. She had been introduced to sex work by her sister Kimberly, who had done sex work on and off since the age of 18. The pair worked for an agency and traveled along the East Coast, but in the months before Amber went missing, 
Kimberly was trying to get out of the industry and find other ways to support her children. At the same time, Amber was struggling more than ever with her addiction to heroin, and she had left the agency and gone it alone on Craigslist, taking more and more low-paid jobs just to feed her addiction. So Kimberly is a contributor to a documentary called America's Serial Killer, and watching that a few years ago was the first time I'd ever heard of this case. Uh, So Kimberly obviously talks a lot about her sister, but she also talks about how the sex work industry on Craigslist works and gives quite a bit of insight into it. So the documentary was on all four here in the UK, but not anymore, just like I am Jane Doe. Um, And I can't find it anywhere else on the internet, not even like the production company's website. Mm. But that's it. And that is in the show notes. But it is really insightful uh, in learning how this kind of sex work works. Yeah. So Amber's drug addiction had begun when she was a teenager. Uh, Before that, she had been a great student. Some sources imply that she had been using drugs as a teenager to deal with being sexually assaulted by a neighbor when she was just six years old. As a result of this horrendous attack, she was not able to have children. Amber had a strong Christian faith, and there were periods in her life where she managed to get clean with help from her local church. But following the death of her pastor, she relapsed. She also married twice, but neither marriage lasted very long. And alongside her sister, she moved between North Carolina, Florida, and New York in the few years before she disappeared. Amber went missing in September 2010, according to the New York Magazine article. Uh, And shortly before she went missing, Kimberly had managed to get her into a rehab facility in Nashua County in Long Island. But Kimberly had to leave Long Island and return to North Carolina to care for their father who was ill. While she was away, Amber relapsed and then disappeared. The family didn't report her missing immediately. To start with, they thought that she had just met someone and was getting high with them. But they also knew that the police weren't going to take the report of a missing sex worker with addiction problems seriously. Her body was found in December along with the other three, and like them, she too had been strangled. So... Craigslist allowed for a degree of an anonymity for both sex workers and clients. Sex workers could use burner phones, throw away email addresses to post their ads, and clients didn't have to provide any personal information when viewing the listings. Whilst that protected the clients, it put the workers in even more danger. Mm. It also left law enforcement at a massive disadvantage because unlike dating apps and websites, for example, where there is like a digital paper trail of who a person has been talking to or arranging to meet up with, Craigslist didn't require personal information to view ads on their erotic pages section. And this meant that even though there were now four bodies, nobody knew who the women had met up with before they died, which obviously hampered the investigation, but we'll talk bit more about the investigation in the second episode next week Mm. Uh, but as the investigation moved along slowly and the search for shannon gilbert continued uh, more and more bodies were discovered between march 29th and april 11 2010 the remains of six more victims were found along gilgo beach and in nearby nassau county on march 29th the partial remains of a woman named jessica taylor were found on gilgo beach these remains were dna matched to partial remains found in july 2003 just days after jessica had gone missing we don't know as much about jessica as we know about the gilgo four or shannon uh, she was 20 when she went missing and was a sex worker She had served time on Rikers Island for driving a stolen car and had struggled with drug addiction. Sadly, it seems that she has been reduced to little more than a stereotype of a murdered sex worker. Her body had been identified in 2003 when the first set of remains were found due to a distinctive tattoo. But now that the rest of her body had been found in Gilgo, Jessica's murder was being linked to the other victims, even though she had been dismembered and the other victims had been strangled and just dumped by the roadside. Another detail that distinguishes Jessica from the other victims is that she wasn't using Craigslist to find clients and was last seen working the streets around the Port Authority. 
This changed a lot of things in the Lisk investigation, because previously the general consensus had been that the killer had only been active for a few years and had been using the internet to find victims. But if Jessica had been murdered by the same killer as the four other victims, the killer had been active for much longer than it originally thought and had used numerous dump sites and had many more victims than previously thought. On April 4th, the partial remains of a woman named Valerie Mack were discovered on Gilgo Beach. Much like Jessica, partial remains had been discovered in Manorville in November 2000, which were then matched to the remains discovered in 2011. Uh, These remains became known as Jane Doe 5, or the Manorville Jane Doe, because they were not identified as Valerie Mack until May 2020. So Valerie was last seen in the summer of 2000 in Port Republic, New Jersey. Before she disappeared, she had been doing sex work in Philadelphia. And that's all we know about her. Um, The second body found that day is still unidentified Mm. and known only as John Doe and is described as the only male victim associated with the Long Island serial killer. But there's a bit more to it than that. This doe is described as an Asian male who was found wearing women's clothing, and it has been suggested that they were in fact a transgender woman who was also a sex worker. Obviously, we have no way of verifying this either way, but it seems to be the most popular explanation. Um, And they're described as being between 17 and 23 years old and died 5 to 10 years before they were discovered in 2011. Now, unlike the other victims, police concluded that this, this victim died from blunt force trauma to the head. The third and final victim discovered on this day, again unidentified, um, and known only as Baby Doe, because this victim was between 16 and 24 months old. They were found less than 100 meters from Valerie's body, wrapped in a blanket, and showed no visible signs of trauma. Um, interestingly, Baby Doe was not related to any of the other victims found on this particular stretch of Gilgo Beach. Two weeks later, on April 11th, two more victims were found in neighboring Nassau County. The first was the partial remains of a woman who became known as Peaches due to her distinctive tattoo of a heart-shaped peach, which has a bite out of it, and two drops of juice falling from it on her chest. Her body had been found in June 1997 in some woods in Hampstead Lake State Park and named Peaches, but her dismembered limbs were found near Cedar Beach in 2011 and named Jane Doe III. Both of these locations uh, are in Nassau County. It wasn't until December 2016 that DNA testing matched the two sets of remains and the Lisk Jane Doe 3 became Peaches. The DNA testing also proved that Peaches was the mother of Baby Doe found on Gilgo Beach, once again linking all the victims to a single killer. Um, A second set of partial remains of a woman were found on April 11th on the nearby Tobe Beach in Nassau County. This woman also remains, still remains unidentified and was referred to as either Jane Doe 7 or Fire Island Jane Doe uh, because they were DNA matched to another set of partial remains which were found on Fire Island in April 1996. So these 10 victims are the official victims of the Long Island serial killer. But you might be thinking around about now, hang on, you spent ages telling us about Shannon Gilbert, but she hasn't been found and isn't an official victim. How does that add up? Well, let me explain. Shannon's body wasn't found until December 2011 in a marsh at Oak Beach, just half a mile from the gated community where she was last seen running terrified. Mm. The official police report claims that Shannon had run into the marsh in a drug-induced panic and drowned, leading to the conclusion of death by misadventure. However, an independent autopsy commissioned by her mother showed that Shannon had no drugs in her system and there was also damage to her hyoid bone, 
which suggests strangulation. Mm. The independent autopsy also notes that Shannon was found lying face up, which is unusual for drowning victims, especially in a marsh with just a couple of inches of water. Um, but when water levels fluctuate by quite large sort of amounts, bodies can get turned over. Mm. But we don't know what the tide and the water was doing at that time as to whether that would have even been possible. Yeah. Uh, despite the second autopsy, Shannon's death is listed as an accident. Although we should note that both autopsies are contested due to the difficulty in extracting bone marrow to run toxicology tests and some smaller bones weren't actually recovered from the marsh. So they could have been like scavenged mm -hmm. at some point by animals. So both both autopsy reports are contested. So we don't know really exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. There are four other potential victims that we know of, and this is according to Wikipedia, and not all other sources include all of these victims. Um, the first is Andre Isaac, who was a drag queen known by the stage name Sugar Bear. He disappeared from Brooklyn in November 2002, and his partial remains are found in Queens the following month. And then in January 2003, further remains were found in Suffolk County, which showed a single bullet wound to the temple. And further remains were found elsewhere in Suffolk County. Another potential victim is 39-year-old Tanya Rush, who was last seen in Brooklyn in June 2008. She had been a telemarketer, but had begun sex work to support her drug addiction. Her body was found five days after she disappeared in a suitcase on the ramp leading to the Southern State Parkway in Suffolk County. Uh, an unidentified woman known as Cherries, because of her cherry tattoos, had also has also been linked to the list. Her partial remains were washed up in a suitcase on a beach in Mamaroneck, Westchester in March 2007. And a few weeks later, her dismembered legs washed up on beaches in Suffolk County. She's been linked to the list because of the similarities to Jessica, Valerie, Peaches, and the Fire Island Jane Doe, and that they were dismembered and disposed of in different locations. The final potential victim is another un unidentified woman whose skeletal remains were discovered in Laddingtown, Suffolk County. There are a number of things that cast out on this woman as a victim of the Lisk, though, including the fact that her body was more than 30 miles from the other victims and she was buried while the others were all disposed of above ground. Yeah, so that is all the known victims and potential victims. Um, the last few, to me, do seem a bit like trying to pigeonhole them into this one serial killer and as we'll talk about next week there's even a theory that the there is actually two serial killers operating in this area mm, yeah i've heard that um which does make make sense this okay like there's like the the fallacy that there's like 500 serial killers operating at any one time in the u.s and apparently the number is actually a lot higher <laughs> So people believe it's like a 500 or something and it's actually like over 2,000. Great. Yeah. So it that theory does make sense. But the fact that there's still so many unidentified victims is absolutely awful to start with that we don't know who these people are and they're... Either they have loved ones who don't know where they are, or there is nobody yeah. looking for them. Yeah. Both both options are absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah. And it just does just go to prove this this theory on the less dead that people just don't care enough. Cause like comparing it to the the teacher who was murdered, mm -hmm. um, 
they, you know, there was so much outcry, so much an outpouring of support and community absolutely left absolutely devastated. But when it's a sex worker who to start with is vulnerable. Yeah. Everyone's like, meh. And it just goes back to this thing, like people it's it's the same as like pro lifers wanting to advocate for the unborn mm-hmm. because they're very easy. People like want to advocate for vulnerable people when they're the perfect victim. When they be you know, when these people have troubled childhoods and things like that, people want to advocate for them. When that troubled childhood leads to mental health problems or leads to addictions or leads to sex work, then suddenly they're just people who made stupid decisions and they deserve to die. And that's not to say that every sex worker has like this deep seated trauma. Yeah. Some do, some don't. That is sort of a very st- stereotypical idea. But it goes back to this idea of the perfect victim. Yeah. I I think also it's uh a lot to do with how the media portrays crime, especially this like twenty four hour news cycle that we have in mm-hmm. modern culture. You saw it again really clearly in the Gabby Petito case that like this young white woman who was of a a well off enough background to go live van life um yeah and uh, you know she went missing and got months of media coverage where mm. like several other women of color went missing in the same exact place in the at the same exact time and nobody heard about them at all but yeah. she's a great story she's a great yeah. thing to put on your screen and say where is she everybody yeah. pay attention and it yeah, absolutely i think that like if we can get to a point where we do put the media spotlight on other types of cases, of cases that, you know, don't usually get covered, then you can start to change that perception and that prejudice against people on the fringes yeah. of society. Yeah. The the question is which big major news network is going to be the first one to actually stand up and do this because they're not going to be popular and they don't care because for them it's about ratings and it's about money yeah and it's it's the balance do we keep showing these you know missing white women and feet into this missing white woman syndrome or do we take a risk and actually show other people who vulnerable people who are the victims of these kind of crimes yeah i think um again to go back to something that we've mentioned already a piece of media that does a really good job of that is the that who killed emma podcast yeah because uh, you know again emma i forget her last name um oh i will i will look um she was a heroin addict she was a sex worker um and she was written off you know it was just assumed that she overdosed or just you know when she was missing and then once she was found it was like oh well That's what happens when you're a sex worker, you get murdered. So, but the the way that that podcast examines her life and her experiences and the experiences of some of the people that she encountered and knew her along the way, um, it's a really different take, you know? Yeah, so um, that podcast is actually... 
um, unavailable at the moment on BBC Sounds, and the description doesn't give her surname. Ah, Emma Caldwell. Cal- Caldwell. That's what it is. Caldwell. Right. Yeah. Um, it could be. There could be a trial happening. Ah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's a uh, temp. It just says temporarily unavailable. Yeah, I think that's on the BBC Sounds app. I think I saw something recently about that. Actually, that uh, it's not showing up uh, on outside of the Sounds app either. There's just a trailer up. Um, yeah. But if it happens to be <laughs> back by the time you hear this, um, yeah, do listen to that because it. It takes a really honest look at how we discount people and how yeah. the media and the police and other people in power discount people who are struggling or who are living different lives than we are. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think that if we can get to a place where we can tell those stories more frequently and on a grander scale yeah. then maybe this yeah. doesn't happen for 10 plus years yeah i mean potentially 20, 25 yeah. years if if these are all related yeah the same perpetrator yeah i don't have much more to say other than this is awful no. yeah so yeah <laughs> i don't know <laughs> there's no there's no easy no nice way to wrap it up Um, really is there and it's not wrapped up because uh there's more to the story that we will go over in the next episode uh in, in part two um so we will uh come back next time and look at the investigation uh, of the Long Island serial killer and the potential suspects. So we'll see you then. Thank you for listening. We'll uh, see you then. Bye. Bye.